It's now time to, uh, to move on to the historical lecture component of our program. This continues a tradition at our annual business meeting of uh, including a scholarly lecture uh, consistent with AIHP's mission of providing historical information to its members and to others. Uh, and we hope it creates more interest in and participation by members of the Institute in the annual business meeting. Our speaker today is Dr. John D. Gravenstein, retired dire global director of medical affairs for Merck Vaccines. Uh, John is currently AIHP vice president. He holds a pharmacy degree from Duquesne University, a master's in education from Boston University, and a PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina. And most notably, he was recently awarded APHA's 2020 Remington Honor Medal for his decades of excellence as a leader in promoting public health and wellness through immunization practice by pharmacists. We are indeed fortunate to have such a notable speaker on such a timely topic and that is applying history's lessons to contemporary COVID-19 vaccination. And this follows on the presentation he gave on vaccine successes, crises, and standards uh, during the social history of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals festival that was held in late September. So Dr. Gravenstein, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, John, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Does that work? We can hear you now. Okay. Uh, Greg offered me a test session and I uh, declined it, so shame on me. <laughs> uh, let me tell you to start how much fun it has been to be on the board. Um, a, because the other directors are pretty cool people, but the, the staff and management are just uh, stellar uh, in their individual school, uh, skills. And uh, just to step on our anniversary. Uh, so, um, in August, I was able to go into a little bit more depth on some of the things I'm going to cover today, but but I didn't bring it into context with today's uh, pandemic, and that's where that's the focus I'm going to, I'm going to take now. Uh, this is what the current burden of the disease is, and any scientist would have been able to say, no, the pandemic is not going to go away on the day after the election, and in fact, yesterday apparently was the the uh, highest case count uh, the country has recorded yet. Um, these have been these blips have been described as waves. They're uh, epidemiologically they're more like surges. Or if you're a musician, you I think we're re rising to a crescendo, uh, which is really bad news because it's not music. It's human um, human suffering. So what can we learn from history that we can apply to today's situation? Well, vaccines must be the safest of all medications. That's society's expectation. Uh, they are given to healthy people to keep them healthy. And because of that, vaccines are studied in the largest populations of any drug. And then they are forever subjected to ongoing safety surveillance uh, that is uh, just gets more and more intricate as more uh, uh, more of science is, is uh, able to more uh, scientific methods are able to be applied to them. What, what I thought I would do is take five themes and uh, take and, and walk you through each of them uh, that apply to um, to, to uh, vaccines in, in the United States, but but in the world, really, there have been production accidents. There have been adverse reactions the, the society has rejected vaccines. I want to talk not just about vaccines, but also about antibody products, because that's um, interesting, too. And then um, these are medical uh, interventions 
that exist in the world of society. And so therefore, there's some military elements, but more to the point, there are political aspects that uh, that live as these products live in our society or are employed in our society. So let me start by talking about the production accidents. And I went through a longer list of them back in August, but I wanna talk about how the accidents have led to responses, to, to scrutiny of the manufacturing processes and the source materials that only ever gets more and more um, um, uh, uh, um, scrupulous, more, more scrutiny, more, uh, more intricate. So uh, in uh, 1901, there was diphtheria antitoxin that was contaminated with tetanus spores and children died. Uh, there was smallpox vaccine that was contaminated with tetanus spores and children died. And these tragedies led uh, the US Congress to adopt the first organized um, regulation in the United States to control any medication at all. Uh, the food drug, the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 came four years later after Sinclair Lewis and all that, you know the story. Um, but, but four years before that, uh, vaccines and antibody products, viruses, serums, toxins, and analogous products uh, were regulated. And what they required was an, a, a license to be renewed annually and that um, uh, there would be unannounced government inspections. And the licenses looked like college diplomas. They were issued by uh, um, the uh, 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 Laboratory of Biological Products, which was part of the Department of Treasury. And uh, you can see this is a 1909 um, uh, uh, license issued to the HK Mulford Company, which was the predecessor company of Mer Merck. And here you see the authorized products handwritten in. Um, I, it, uh, there are uh, many military stories, military history stories of how vaccines uh, have been valuable. And I take you to the Spanish-American War with no vaccine against yellow fever and contrast that with World War II with uh, an early vaccine with a tremendous reduction in the number of cases despite millions of uh, military personnel being sent into yellow fever endemic zones. But the, but the heart of this story was an unrecognized contamination of, of the early product with, uh, with uh, albumin uh, harvested from human serum that had not been heat treated. And allowed hepatitis A, uh, hepatitis um, B virus to persist in the, uh, in, in the product and therefore infect active hepatitis B virus, and therefore infect uh, um, uh, at least 50,000 people, uh, 50,000 troops uh, with that virus. Uh, this helped to differentiate hepatitis A from hepatitis B, because this is of course, uh, what, 70 years ago, uh, or 80 years ago. And um, it was also realized that uh, the chicken eggs in which this uh, uh, vaccine had been produced were infected with, a, with an avian Virus. Now that didn't cause any harm, but it, you know, it, 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 this is, you know, you you know the expression of adventitious agents, and the result was uh, increasing manufacturing standards to scrutinize not just the production process, but the source materials and the screening process to confirm not just the identity of the source materials, but any uh, hitchhiker viruses that might be passing through it. So. Um, I was trying to figure out how to show visually uh, all of the intricate controls that in the modern era, the FDA imposes and the um, European Medicines Agency imposes and a variety of regulators in Japan and Australia and many other countries, what that they impose for product quality. And this is, these are the, this is the, uh, the, the duties, the responsibilities of one little piece of the FDA in terms of uh, did you know that every lot of every vaccine is individually released, unlike small molecule medications? And so just an intricate, intricate uh, requirement. One of the uh, um, uh, center directors of the FDA was interviewed a, a couple of weeks ago. He, he was talking about vaccine appli applications for vaccine licenses for the coronavirus vaccines that the FDA will receive, presumably, pretty soon. And he commented that, the, that the, the size of the application was over 100,000 pages long because basically they get 
a case report on every volunteer in every trial. And if the FDA wants to, to rearrange the analyses, they have the raw data with which to do it. How else visually show the intricacy of the, manu com the, of the contemporary manufacturing standards? This is just some, some guidance, the titles of guidance to industry documents and FDA rules in the last several years. And you can see that all the different ways that FDA controls the manufacturing process, the conduct of clinical trials, and all the other aspects of, uh, of vaccine development. Let me move on to adverse events. When vaccine people talk about adverse events um, to avoid any assumption of cause and effect, if it's a true cause and effect relationship, we would say adverse reaction, and the, and both are true, both or both have occurred after um, after vaccines, some coincidental effects and some truly cause and effect related events. Uh, but uh, the result of the, both of those is uh, a, a ever more intricate safety surveillance program for early detection and for uh, adjudication of whether a mirage. Is, or any given event is a mirage, not true, or a true cause and effect relationship. And I use the example of the uh, salt polio vaccine. This is a cover of Life magazine uh, from April of 1955. You know, rush, 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 let's get this vaccine out there. And then there was the Cutter incident in a book Paul Offit has, uh, has uh, described in considerable detail. 50 cases of polio that was directly caused because by not following Jonas Salk's recipe uh, carefully enough. Uh, and so some of the virus was caught up in a filter and some live virus got up, got uh, uh, um, transferred into the actual vaccine product. So, the, so 56 people were harmed directly by the vaccine. But curiously, from a societal perspective, there were hundreds more cases that were caused because the vaccine program was stopped. And so the epidemic of the disease at the time could continue unabated. And uh, that clearly will have bearing on people saying in December, well, there's not enough safety information about that COVID vaccine. Well, how many more cases of COVID infection will occur? Because we haven't been satisfied that there's been enough safety data. Here's a great case of a coincidence and a cause and effect relationship. So. Swine flu vaccination program in 1976. In January of 76, there was one death, 13 hospitalizations. There was a major program uh, mobilized, the biggest vaccination program ever to that point. Well, there was a uh, signal of three people getting the vaccine and dying of a heart attack on the same day. The, the, the three people died of the heart attack on the same day. All three people died several hours after vaccination. And, and the concern was, oh, oh no, this is a horrible side effect. Uh, you know, newspaper headlines and all that. But nobody had stopped to compare how many heart attacks happen in Pittsburgh on any given day, heart attack deaths at that point. And it was way more than three. And so this is the cautionary tale of what are you comparing the adverse event to? What's the background rate? What's expected uh, even in the absence of a vaccination program? This one was a mirage. It was not true, not a true cause and effect relationship. But there was a cause and effect relationship uh, uh, realized with uh, the swine flu vaccine and Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a uh, neuromuscular paralytic uh, condition, at about four times the, the unvaccinated rate. It's not that uh, uh, we, we would expect um, uh, any vaccine to have some degree of Guillain-Barre syndrome follow it, because it happens in unvaccinated people. It's the four times higher part that was the uh, confirmation that this was a true cause and effect relationship. What's, what's the situation now? Th these are two different uh, kind of descriptions of uh, the, the vaccine safety monitoring programs conducted by the FDA. VAERS is the adverse event reporting system. It's a spontaneous, it's the uh, vaccine counterpart to MedWatch, if you're familiar with that. It's anybody can send in a, a, a product complaint or a, a, a report of, a, of a, an individual event. As an epidemiologist, I know the greater scientific power is over in the vaccine safety data link, 
which uses database to compare millions of vaccine recipients to millions of non-recipients, and so be able to tease apart coincidence from cause and effect. There's also this, this one, whoops, sorry. Uh, this vSafe is a new one. It's gonna be a cell phone based telemonitoring system for people who get the COVID vaccines uh, to uh, let them uh, provide, uh, you know, with newer technologies, uh, the ability to send in more information. This blue box over here is a different, it's a different web page from CDC. They have a listing the, the existing safety monitoring programs. These are all the normal things that happen every day in the background. You probably didn't know about it and they're going to do more. And so uh, what, what ha how did we learn from history? How did uh, the CDC learn from history? It's that they've got to be on top of it and be able to um, tell people uh, uh, what's, what's true and what's a mirage. Let, let's go to um, public communication, which in the negative is rejection. And hopefully by explaining things, we can get to acceptance. This is what the internet looked like in 1802. Uh, this was a broadsheet uh, where, you know, Jenner's cowpox vaccine was accused of causing uh, uh, cow parts to grow out of various uh, uh, parts of your body and uh, to, to insult the vaccine. Uh, and uh, the internet uh, brings us uh, this and more on every vaccine made now globally at the speed of light. And uh, so how do we explain the value of vaccines to people? Well, let me give you a, a, another military example. This was, uh, was uh, from the Boer War in South Africa, what's now South Africa. British scientists developed the first typhoid vaccine. Um, people boarded the ship on the way to, between England and uh, southern tip of Africa and threw the vaccine overboard, uh, akin to the British tea, or the Boston Tea Party. So the British military made the vaccine optional. 14,000 soldiers took it. They had a 2% um, infection rate. The unvaccinated soldiers had a 14% infection rate, which amounted to a lot of cases and a, a good number of deaths from typhoid fever. And at the next war, 97% of British troops accepted the vaccine. So the question is, how do you get people to accept a vaccine and avoid uh, the um, needless deaths? Well, communication is part of it, and maybe you're going to use Elvis, and, as they did in the 1950s, to talk about polio vaccine. And they got, they somebody grabbed Harrison Ford to narrate a, a public service announcement to get people to apply for uh, the COVID-19 vaccine trials. But you need to know who your audience is. Harrison Ford probably has less pertinence or or fluency uh, in an African-American or a Hispanic or a Hmong uh, population or, you know, and so you, you need to match your spokesperson uh, with the audience that you're talking to. And so there's a whole degree of, uh, uh, of communication sciences uh, that need to be applied to explaining in a legitimate uh, non fear mongering, responsible way, uh, what science has to offer. Uh, let me uh, diverge and talk about antibody products before, because I, uh, I think it's kind of cool. And the analogy I'm going to use is diphtheria antitoxin, which those of you who are um, uh, history buffs will know. Oh, you're all history buffs, what am I saying? Um, the Iditarod, did you know that the Iditarod? Uh, dog sled race commemorates the um, uh, movement of diphtheria antitoxin from the port cities of Alaska out to where there was an well two different outbreaks of diphtheria out in the uh, out in the Alaskan bush. And so, uh, uh, if you re have been to Central Park in New York, uh, you know that's Balto's statue. Statue Balto, the lead sled dog. Uh, and if you want to read something a little more. Uh, methodical, the cruelest miles is a good good story on this one. Um, tetanus also gives us a way of looking at the difference between uh, antibody products and vaccines. In 1917, for World War One, tetanus antitoxin, uh, which was horse serum that had a high concentration of tetanus antibodies in it, uh, was the great advance. Uh, and so that was, finally there was a way to treat uh, tetanus in, in early cases of tetanus or or to give prophylaxis of people who had been wounded. Now, it, th this is the origin of the term serum sickness uh, for humans developing anti-horse antibodies. Uh, and, and so that needed to be taken into account. 
but the, um, the, 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 the better advance was when tetanus toxoid, a vaccine, a modified toxin came along. And so in 1941, as World War, I, or World War II starts, we able to start giving that to the troops and um, a much smaller number of, um, of tetanus cases, uh, only 12 tetanus cases throughout all of World War II. Uh, unlike Germany, where the Luftwaffe of the Air Force gave tetanus toxoid, but the German army did not in a much different um, uh, rate of disease. I've got two World War II dog tags over here. Uh, if you, this is the name, this is O for officer and serial number T for tetanus toxoid, a dose in 1942, a dose in 1944, next of kin, that's O for blood type. And it surprised me that there was no positive or negative there. And I went and looked at my dad, this is my dad's uh, dog tag, and he also has only the blood type, not the RH factor on it. P for Protestant, C for Catholic, his, his T42, T43. So you can see that this is a very permanent, very crude, very durable immunization record. Where are we today? Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, th these pictures. I'm going to make an analogy for those of you who are, who are hunters between shotguns and rifles. Uh, 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 shotgun shells with pellets of a variety of sizes uh, and uh, a rifled bullet and its ability to be highly targeted. And so uh, in today's, this year, we've seen convalescent plasma locally collected, hyperimmune globulins that have a more measured potency, uh, unlike convalescent plasma from several manufacturers, and then monoclonal antibodies, that's the analogy to the rifle bullet, very highly targeted um, products being developed, either uh, perhaps with an EUA or still in, in clinical trials. But, but uh, the, the point here is how uh, we've gone back to some um, old style approaches and then harnessed a biotechnology to try to get a more targeted approach. And so we can watch um, history repeating itself in a microcosm here. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, vaccine nationalism or better yet collaboration and uh, see uh, where things are going there. Well, the story of uh, George Washington in the smallpox vaccine, or sorry, variolation, uh, slightly different, um, uh, for the Continental Army. And the point was that a task force advancing on Quebec became ill with smallpox. They were not vaccinated. They had they lost uh, over half of the force uh, to smallpox uh, disease. We lost we the continent we the uh, Americans lost the Battle of Quebec and retreated. And I argue uh, that because of that, the British forces stayed in what was Upper Canada at the time, uh, and uh, Canada goes on to become eventually a, an independent country. If we had won the Battle of Quebec, who knows? We might uh, that might be a, st a U.S. state at this point, and maybe the British would be over in the Maritime Provinces or uh, or out of the uh, continent entirely. And so, the lack of a vaccine uh, matters in uh, uh, military history. Um, today, you see a variety of countries, uh, the United States has bought, or, or has contracted for, I should say, five times as much vaccine as there is population, partially because it didn't know which products would succeed or fail in clinical trials. It may be that they all succeed eventually, and the U.S. will have too much vaccine and will, you know, then release it to go to other parts of the world. Um, but... Uh, so, you know, uh, the U.S. has been criticized for being nationalistic, for contracting for, uh, you know, court, trying to corner the market on, on its on vaccine for its people. Yet there's another um, uh, way of looking at it that those government contracts were the stimulus to say to the, I mean, to the developers, we will pay your bills. So go ahead and take your risks and, and build your plants and scale up. And here's guaranteed money if it works. Um, or here's guaranteed money, you, you, whether it or not. And so that it, it, you, you can criticize it from a nationalism perspective, but there's also an industrial security element that is, that is indisputably positive. There's a new uh, NGO, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness uh, Innovations, that is trying to take, by means of something called the COVAX facility, 
to get countries to pledge money to buy to to pool their resources for uh, invention and development, and and then to help pay for vaccine for Africa, vaccine for uh, uh, impoverished Asia or Bolivia, uh, that sort of thing. And um, so that's a, a, another social movement that will uh, try to get vaccines to the developing world faster. And you see silliness out of Russia trying to. Uh, uh, get vaccines, licensing vaccines before they ever did. Well, they did uh, do, do clinical trials in about 88 people and then licensed the vaccine, whereas uh, the West is doing tens of thousands of people. China is uh, is followed more typical patterns for uh, clinical trials, but is, well, and is um, uh, try selling the vaccine in Latin America and in Africa and using it, using the vaccine as a as a wedge for uh, diplomatic influence, um, and Russia has sent its vaccine to Venezuela and places like that. So I hope I've given you five different ways of looking at how history informs uh, where we are going today with uh, response to the the pandemic. We're smarter because of things that have gone wrong in the past. Um, we it's you know we we know what to do better, and yet it's still. Uh, a human uh, enterprise, and we um, uh, know that uh, uh, you know the, 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 how how the 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 politic the inter you know the suppression of the CDC, the interaction of CDC and HHS, the the uh, what the uh, White House does or doesn't allow the COVID uh, task force to do or say is uh, is part of our current situation. <laughs> I'm going to skip those two and go to my close and um, just encourage you all to wear your masks, get your flu shots, and um, uh, and and read the read the evidence for the COVID vaccines once it's available. Well, John, thank you for a most enlightening uh, presentation. I will point out a copy of this lecture will be made available on the AIHP website. Um, so be sure to send that to all those who were unable to attend today. Uh, are there any questions for John? Well, John, I have one. What do you look on as the role of pharmacists in the coming uh, national immunization campaign? So you've seen uh, HHS do a variety of things to empower pharmacists to be prescribers of the, the uh, COVID vaccines once they're available, uh, a variety of other pandemic uh, 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 interventions as well. And you saw in the press in the last week or two, a specific contract with CVS and with Walgreens, the chains, to reach um, uh, people in long-term care facilities where health departments don't, you know, don't have nearly as good a, a kind of access as, uh, as as organized pharmacy does, uh, so and so uh, the early days will be limited availability of supply, but but once there is enough vaccine for everybody, I think you're going to see uh, every vaccinating pharmacy in the country uh, involved one way or another. Okay, uh, I see Cheryl Warsh uh, has a question. Uh, Cheryl, you would unmute your computer. Cheryl, I think you're muted. That better? That's it. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, just one one preliminary point. As a Canadian historian, I noticed that every time American historians delve into Canadian uh, history, it's all about how the opportunities they had to take us over and make us better. <laughs> and, and we can debate that whether you know the vaccine would have happened became American, but that's another issue. Um, well, imagine I, imagine the United States having to be bilingual with French. <laughs> oh, horrors, horrors. <laughs> One of the things uh, I just want to ask you one thing. You mentioned your father in the army. My mom was a whack in World War II, and all the whacks were giving the given the flu shot before they would dare to give it to the soldiers overseas, the men, and they all got horribly sick. And then they say, "Hey, this is too strong a shot. We better, you know, lighten it up to give the boys." And I'm wondering whether whether the army or any kind of compulsory group is part of the testing today. 
Uh, so several stories. So the it, it was the Army Surgeon General in 1941 that commissioned the research that led to influenza vaccines, uh, and they were whole cell whole virus vaccines, unlike the split virus semi purified vaccines we get today. Uh, so you should know that one of my jobs in the army was to oversee 10 institutional review boards, 10 medical ethics boards for 10 different army hospitals. And so, um, the army, uh, uh, it was the CIA who gave LSD to people. It was not the army. Um, the, uh, the army has a long, long record of abiding by all, um, uh, thinking accords and, and, uh, the human research ethics uh, um, um, elements. So, military, so, so there there might be some tr some I, some you know troops somewhere who volunteered for one of the trials. I kind of doubt it because they also have to agree not to you know not to be deployed away from the clinical trial site. Uh, but they could have, but they would have had to sign the same consent form as anybody else. Okay. Thanks. And I see that we have a question from John Swan. Uh, John writes, you mentioned the cases directly affected by Cutter vaccine, but there were a lot more cases, paralytic and non-paralytic, from family and community contact, about 260 in all. Uh, perhaps small compared to the temporary suspension of the vaccine, but. Yeah, that's a point. Uh, I, uh, I may not have spent enough time uh, checking my numbers for that slide, so I'll, I'll double check and see if I need to uh, toss another uh, uh, caveat in there. Thank you, John. Are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see any listed in the chat. Kristen, do you see any hands raised? Nope. No. Okay, very good. Well, John, thank you once again for a very thoughtful and stimulating presentation. We are most grateful. My pleasure.